Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter 3. It's been a little bit since we've been in the book of Mark, so I do want to just kind of give us a little bit of a recap of where we've been and uh, just help remind us of some of the things that we've been looking at and seeing. Uh, and this is, again, at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's establishing himself as one who has that authority. We've seen him exercise this authority in a variety of ways. We've seen him uh, teaching with authority as he comes forth. He, he teaches, and all the people are amazed, like, man, wh- who is this? This, this guy, he's, he's teaching with authority. That's, uh, this is, he's not ta- teaching like the scribes and the Pharisees, but he's, he seems like he's really got something here. We see him acting with authority. As he casts out evil spirits, the evil spirits cower before him and he exercises them and casts them out. We see him exercising authority over our very illnesses and and diseases and sicknesses and disabilities that different people have. Jesus is stepping into these situations and he is clearing those things up. The illnesses are going away, The, the disabilities are being healed. Jesus is exercising authority over the physical realm, over the very bodies of individuals. We see him exercising authority as he says that he has the authority to forgive sins. The scribes and the Pharisees are amazed that this guy says, your sins are forgiven. Like, who can forgive sins but God alone? The answer is no one. But Jesus Christ is forgiving sins. He is claiming to be God in human flesh. We see him exercising authority as he calls his disciples to him and says, come, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. And he calls them to make disciples. He exercises authority there. He exercises authority over even the Sabbath itself and over the rituals, the religious uh, systems of the day. Jesus Christ says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. So he has authority over the religious systems. And this is troublesome to some people. It's troublesome to the, uh, to the religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, those that would claim to, to have authority and to teach the law. We see various re- reactions to Jesus as he goes around doing all these things and demonstrating that he is one with authority. As he teaches, he teaches uh, that to enter into the kingdom of God, you must come through repentance and faith. We saw that those were some of the very first words of Jesus as he began his public ministry. Repent and believe the gospel. And so this is the message that he is, he is proclaiming. These are the things that he is doing, de- establishing himself as one, as having authority And then we see the rejections begin to unfold in chapter 2. The Pharisees, they outright reject him. They say, no, we will not listen to this man. We do not appreciate this man. And we saw at the very beginning of of chapter 3 how so quickly the Pharisees have decided that they're going to plot to kill Jesus Christ because they outright reject Jesus. They reject his teaching. They reject his authority. They reject the gospel. We see others. We see the crowd that is flocking to him. But yeah, as you kind of dig down and, and look at how the crowd is reacting to Jesus, it seems like they're really kind of mostly interested in what Jesus can do for them. They're really interested in, in getting their physical needs taken care of. Oh, Jesus, heal my arm. Oh, Jesus, heal this. Oh, Jesus, heal my leprosy. But they don't seem to be as concerned with who Jesus is and what Jesus can do for their souls. So we see this this reaction of of the people. And as we look at our passage here today, we're going to see a couple more reactions of the people to Jesus. And we're going to see how Jesus responds to those reactions and that will inform us about maybe how we should be responding to Jesus as well. We are going to cover a lot of ground today, verses uh, 20 all the way through 35. Uh, so 
Um, Let's just dive right in as we look at Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 20. Jesus entered a house, and the crowd gathered again so that they were not even able to eat. When his family heard this, they set out to restrain him because they said, he's out of his mind. The scribes who had come down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and he drives out demons by the ruler of demons. So he summoned them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but, it is, but is finished. So no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. So we have this, this scene unfolding before us. We have this, this crowd of people that are flocking to Jesus. And we've seen this sort of thing once before. We saw it in chapter 2 when uh, Jesus was there in the house and he was teaching. There were so many people and uh, there was that paralytic man that was brought before Jesus to be healed. But they couldn't get him inside the house because there were just so many people. So many people that they could not bring him. So they ended up climbing on the roof, digging a hole through the roof and lowering him down in order for Jesus to heal this man. And we see something similar here with all these people. There's so many people, this crowd is so large, and they're just crammed into this house that they can't even eat food. They, they, they can't even just, just sit down and just enjoy a meal together because there's just so many people. They can't get the food in and out. They can't interact that way. And so this, this crowd and this, this, this just crowding into this house Seems like it's bothered a few people. Two reactions here back to back that I find each of them quite interesting. <clears throat> Notice what happens in verse 21. When his family heard this, they set out to restrain him because they said he's out of his mind. So when his family heard this, when they heard that, that Jesus had all these people at this house, they were just, they were just so packed in there. When they heard about this, well, we, know, we can't have this. They set out to restrain him. Now, your, your translation, when, it's, when I have when his family heard this, your translation might say when his friends heard this or when his own people heard this. The original language there is, uh, it, t- it says literally, when those of his heard this. So there's a little bit of ambiguity there as to what that could actually be referring to. Is it, it could be referring to his uh, relatives on a broad level, just his kinsmen. It could be referring to just uh, his countrymen, his fellow countrymen. It could be a little bit more specific in referring to um, his friends or even immediate family. At the very least, I do think that this is talking about individuals that uh, are, would be considered close to Jesus in some way, whether that's his friends or, or close friend, uh, family or close friends and associates or something of that nature. But those, these would have been individuals that would have known Jesus well and have been, uh, been very familiar with him and seemed close to him. And apparently, they seem embarrassed by what Jesus is doing. They see what he is doing and they say, Jesus is acting in an irresponsible manner. His behavior is not fitting. So they set out to restrain him. And notice what it says, he is out of his mind. That's some very strong terminology. Jesus, Jesus is insane. They think he's totally lost his senses. He's a madman. I saw one commentator that said a good translation with it. Jesus has gone berserk. They just, there's just a strong reaction to the things that Jesus is doing. These, these individuals aren't coming to Jesus, and they're not just you know, trying to come in there and be like, all right, now, now come along, Jesus. You don't, don't, yes, I know you think you're God. Don't just, just come along. No, it's not like that. Now, they're going in there to restrain him. That's a strong word as well. It speaks of almost of a detainment. 
They're going in there to take custody, to seize, to detain Jesus because they think he's going insane. He's not mentally stable, but he's insane, behaving in such a way that they cannot tolerate it. You lost your mind, Jesus. I don't know what you think you got going on, but this is not okay. We've got to get you out of there. So that's one reaction. Reaction of insanity. Here's the second in verse 22. The scribes who had come down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and he drives out demons by the ruler of the demons. So Jesus is a man here that claims authority. And not only that, but he claims the very authority of God. Jesus He's, he's making it clear who he thinks he is through his actions and through his words. You know, we saw earlier about how he's saying, I can forgive sins. I have this authority, and I'm proving it by healing this paralytic man. So Jesus is very clear about who he is claiming to be. But the scribes refuse to believe this claim by Jesus Christ. They refuse to accept that the things that Jesus is doing, He is doing in the power of Almighty God. Because after all, I mean, they're the scribes and the Pharisees. I mean, they would know, right? They're the ones that understand the law. They know what the Messiah is supposed to look like. So this, this guy clearly can't be God. He cannot be the Messiah. As far as they're concerned, as far as the scribes and the Pharisees are concerned, Jesus is messing everything up. He is turning the entire religious system on its head as He redefines and, and as d demonstrates this authority, even over the Sabbath itself. And I think they're beginning to feel that they're losing their position of power and authority over the people. They're not okay with that. So they reject the fact of the source of this power because the one thing they cannot deny is they cannot deny that Jesus is exercising real power and authority here. They can't deny that. I mean, that's, that's plain as day. They see the demons being cast out. They see these individuals being healed. They hear His teaching, and it's very strong teaching. They cannot deny the acts that Jesus is doing. But if they refuse the source of that power as being God, then they have to invent alternative explanations of why he might be having this power. First, they say he's possessed by Beelzebul, which, of course, refers to the devil. They say the only way that Jesus could be doing these things is if he was possessed by Satan himself. It's a pretty strong charge, strong claim. The second thing they say, and it's, it's really related to that first claim, but they say that he drives out demons by the ruler of the demons or by the authority of the ruler of the demons. The only reason Jesus could cast out demons is because Satan himself has given him authority and has told Jesus and commanded him to do these things. So that's the charge that they have. Once again, they can't deny that demons are being driven out. They can't deny that. That's, that's plain as day. It's right in front of them. But they dare not accept the premise that Jesus is God. So the only other solution is that Jesus is doing these things through the power of the devil himself. One of the things I find interesting about these responses is that the responses that we have here, these, we've got these, these family, these friends, they're saying, Jesus, you've lost your mind. You're crazy now. You're, you're a madman. You've gone berserk. You're out of your mind. And then you have the scribes and the Pharisees saying, oh, no, you're, you're not who you claim you are. No, you're possessed by the devil. You're possessed by Satan. I find it interesting, these two responses are reflected in what's considered what has been called the great trilemma of the ages. 
know if you're familiar with that at all. The Great Trilemma of the Ages. This was an argument that C.S. Lewis popularized. It wasn't something that he came up with. Uh, he didn't invent it. It's this trilemma has uh, been talked about and has been discussed at various levels for literally hundreds of years, although to my knowledge, C.S. Lewis was the first one to alliterate it, and of course, that makes all the pastors love him, and so he gets all the credit for it. <laughs> uh, but the argument goes like this, if Jesus is not Lord, he is either a liar or a lunatic. Those are your three options, liar, lunatic, or Lord. He's either lying about who he claims to be, or he is self-deluded. He thinks he is who he claims to be, but it's not true, so he's, he's a lunatic. He's self-deluded. Or, if the pages of scriptures accurately preserve the real words of a historical figure, and we have every evidence in the world to believe that they do, then those are the only options, that Jesus is Lord. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. And we see this reflected in these individuals. His family and his friends, they call him a lunatic. They say he's crazy. He's out of his mind. So much so that we have to go and detain him. He's not safe for the public. He's mentally unstable. He's a lunatic. They grew up with him. Jesus, we know who you are. You know, you're our brother. I mean, you, you, you're a carpenter. You worked on our house. You're not God. You're crazy. This is crazy talk. You're a lunatic. We've come to restrain you. And there's the scribes. Jesus isn't who he's claiming to be. The scribes are calling him a liar. Jesus claims to be God, but the scribes say, no, you're not, you're not God. You're not God in human flesh. You're not the Messiah. You're a liar. You are from the devil, not Lord. They charge him with lying. He doesn't cast out demons by God's power, but the devil's. So he is a liar. And as we stand here today, all of us have to choose who we will believe as we read through these stories. What will we say of Christianity? Will we say that Jesus is a lunatic and that those who follow him are foolish as well for believing in a, in a crazed man? Perhaps we're self-deluded as well. Will we say that Jesus was a liar? He did not. He was not who he claimed to be and he knew it. Some would even extend that argument out and say, well, those in the church, those leaders in the church, would even, they know that what they're teaching is a lie. They're only after your money or their, your allegiance for some other purposes. Or is Jesus who he claims he is? Is he Lord? And if he is, then there are some serious implications that we have to reckon with in response to that. So we'll see that Jesus demonstrates that he is, in fact, Lord. He's going to respond to these accusations, and, and his response is going to give us a critical understanding of who he is and how we should respond to him. And at first, we see that Jesus uses simple logic, really simple, basic logic, Jesus uses to demonstrate who he is, and that this logic is going to show that, okay, he's not just a crazy man, he's capable of rational thought, and then in that logic, he demonstrates that he is not under the power of the devil, because that would be counterproductive for the devil. So let's pick it up back up in verse 23. So he summoned them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is finished. Now, in many ways, this just seems like common sense. And honestly, 
It is. <laughs> if a kingdom is divided against itself, if there's internal power struggles going on there, that kingdom's not going to survive for a very long time. Basic logic. So it stands to reason that the same is true when it comes to Satan and his kingdom. If he is, has these internal struggles going on within himself, if, the, if Satan is acting against Satan or the other forces of Satan are working against some forces of Satan, Satan knows that's not going to be a positive thing. So he's not going to direct things in this way. So Jesus applies that logic to the situation. Jesus is clearly working against the powers of Satan in these first few chapters. I mean, his very first act, the very first miracle that he performed in the book of Mark that we've seen was casting out an evil spirit. And then as we move through the book of Mark just so far, what we've seen so far in just these first three chapters, casting out demons has been mentioned six times already. And in some of those cases, it says, and Jesus cast out many demons. So Jesus is clearly acting against the forces of Satan. He's casting out demons. He's, he's healing people of their illnesses and diseases and afflictions. It does not stand to reason that Jesus would be performing these acts under the power of the very one with, against whom he is performing these acts. That, that just does not stand to basic logic. Satan is not a dummy that is just clueless about how to divide his forces, about how to direct his, those under his command. So it makes zero sense for Jesus to be casting out demons and be working for Satan. And so by that logic, Jesus is showing that he's not completely insane. He's not out of his mind. He's not a lunatic. He's able to follow rational thought and then apply it to a situation. And then through that logic, he demonstrates that he is not working for Satan, and therefore he is not the liar that the scribes and the Pharisees would make him out to be. But notice what Jesus says next in verse 27. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can plunder his house. Okay, so what does that have to do with anything? When I was first reading through this, it just, it almost in some ways just kind of felt out of place. Like, okay, Jesus has got this flawless logic flowing here. Then we get to this verse and it's like, what now? Two things I think that are going on here. Um, in this illustration, uh, I think the strong man is the devil. That is who is being referred to there. And Jesus is the one who is plundering. If Jesus is the one who is working for Satan, then he would be plundering his own house. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But the larger point is that the strong man's house is in fact being plundered. Satan's kingdom is in fact being raided. And that is a big deal. That is a key critical component to this narrative as we read through this. What Jesus is claiming is that he has in fact bound the strong man and he is plundering his house as he is performing these miracles, as he is freeing people from their possession, as he is freeing people from the demonic oppression that is going on. Jesus is plundering the strong man's house. Again, I mentioned that the, the amount of times that we have here that Jesus has cast out demons, it's mentioned six times already. And that represents dozens or even hundreds of cases where Jesus has cast out demons and has healed individuals. So Jesus, there's really something significant going on here with Jesus. The devil's house is being plundered. His kingdom is being raided. I think it's possible that there's an allusion here to Isaiah 49, verses 24 through 26. It says this, Can plunder be taken from warriors, or captives be rescued from the fierce? But this is what the Lord says. 
Yes, captives will be taken from warriors and plunder retrieved from the fierce. I will contend with those who contend with you, and your children I will save. I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh. They will be drunk on their own blood as with wine. Then all mankind will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior, your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob." So how are we to understand this verse 27 back here in the, in the book of Mark is, as Jesus says, okay, you, know, you, can't, you can't plunder a strong man's house unless that strong man is first bound and then we can plunder his house. Two things. First, Jesus clearly is claiming to be raiding Satan's house. And the only one who's strong enough to do that is Almighty God. No other force, no other power exists that can effectively plunder and raid the house of the devil. So Jesus is claiming to be Lord. And second, if Jesus is alluding to this Isaiah passage as it seems to be, His claim to being the Messiah is only that much more clear. Because in that passage, the one doing the plundering is none other than the Redeemer, the Savior, the Mighty One of Jacob, the Messiah. So Jesus defends himself. He says, I'm not a lunatic. I'm not crazy. And I'm not lying. I'm performing these acts. It would be senseless for me to be doing this if I'm under the power of the devil. But no, I'm raiding the strong man's house. I am Lord. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop with simply defending himself against these foolish accusations, but he presses his advantage and makes really a rather stunning pronouncement. Verses 28 through 30. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for all their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Much has been written over the years about this concept of the unforgivable sin. I, had, I knew someone at school who I was just in conversations with him, and he was real distraught about this, and, and he was worried that maybe he possibly may have con- committed this unforgivable sin, in which if he had, that really would have left him in a really difficult situation. Because right here, it's very clear, the unforgivable sin is just that. It's unforgivable. You cannot be forgiven for this sin. But what is it? What is this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? It's an eternal sin that is said here that will not be forgiven. What is this? Well, in context, Jesus, again, is dealing with these very serious accusations. The Pharisees, the the scribes there, are witnessing the divine power of Jesus Christ. Jesus is demonstrating His divine power. He's working in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's casting out demons. He's healing people of their afflictions. He's forgiving sins. And the scribes and the religious leaders are looking directly into the face of this, viewing the very work of God on earth, the very work of the Holy Spirit manifested in the Messiah, manifested in God in human flesh. And they're saying, no, that is not God's work. That is the the work of the devil. They're witnessing the most impressive display of glory that the world has ever seen and attributing it to Satan, to the devil. That is blasphemy in the highest degree. That is a rejection of the Spirit-empowered Messiah, God in human flesh. So that sin cannot be forgiven. It is the ultimate rejection, utter and final rejection of the Redeemer renders them irredeemable. Some have wondered, you know, can this sin be even committed today? personally would lean towards no because no one is witnessing the direct power, the direct glory of Jesus Christ on earth as they were witnessing it in those days. 
It's hard to attribute the works of Jesus, the works of the Messiah to the devil if we aren't personally witnessing those things firsthand. But even if it could be committed today, this verse is not intended to produce anxiety in people, making them wonder, oh no, have I, have I committed the, the unforgivable sin, the unpardonable sin? Am I in this position? That's not the intent of the verse. This verse stands as a warning to not harden your heart and to offer that ultimate, final, and utter rejection of the Messiah. I would say if you're worried, if you're concerned, like, oh, have, have I committed the sin? The very fact alone that, that you're in that position of worrying about that I think is evidence that you haven't committed it because it shows that, that your heart is still sensitive to the things of the Spirit. It's still, it's still sensitive to right and wrong. It's still soft. It is not hardened against the truth of God's Word. It shows that you have not, in fact, landed on that ultimate final rejection of the Messiah. So if you've ever been concerned about that, oh, have I, have I committed the unpardonable sin? I hope that's an encouragement to you, that that concern alone is evidence that you've not committed that sin. Well, as we uh, wrap up this section here, we've got a few verses to go, verses 31 through 35. His mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. The crowd was sitting around him and told him, look, your mother and your brothers and your sisters, they're outside asking for you. He asked them, who are my mother and my brothers? Looking at those sitting in the circle around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Now, in many ways, this is similar to the uh, opening section that we looked at today. Uh, we see uh, these individuals that, um, that could be family, as those of his, uh, could be family, close friends, relatives, um, and they were coming in wanting to restrain him. And now we see uh, his mother and brothers calling for him and asking for him. Jesus is about the Lord's business. He's teaching and instructing the people. And once again... Individuals come along seeking to pull Jesus away from that task. But I want us to notice some of the key words here uh, because they're, they're very important as we understand the significance of what's going on. First, we see that the family is outside. They're not part of the, fam- of the crowd that's listening to Jesus. They're not inside the house, but they're outside. Second, they're calling to him. This, is, this calling is a call of summons. They're wanting to draw him away. To what intent they have, that's, that's not stated exactly what the intent is. But Jesus is active in ministry and the family is trying to summon him away from this activity. And it's very possible, and I would say even likely, that his brothers would have been among the group that would have been seeking to restrain him in this first instance as we saw in earlier verses. Then we read in verse 32, that the message from his family is finally relayed from his family into Jesus through the crowd. And he is told, your family is looking for you. And this word looking for, that word is used to ten times throughout the gospel of Mark. And every single time, without fail, it carries negative connotations about the looking. A couple of times it's talking about drawing Jesus away from the ministry that he is engaged in. Another time, it was about, uh, several other times, it was about this, as when Jesus was going to be on trial, when the scribes, the Pharisees were looking for him to take him away into custody towards death. But the seeking connotes an attempt to determine and control rather than to submit and follow. That is the connotation of that word. They're looking for Jesus. They're not just looking for Him like, oh, where is Jesus? Oh, there He is. No, they're looking for Him that they might control Him and direct Him to whatever their ends might be. How does Jesus respond? He asks this question. It's a poignant question. Who are my brothers and my mother? And the question is answered in a rather unexpected way. Jesus redefines what it means to be family. 
it's not those who, with whom he just shares some DNA with, but rather those who do God's will that Jesus calls his family, his true family. Blood relationships are now secondary. They're now secondary. And it's the relationships between those who do God's will that truly count. You know, we see this, this phrase, the will of God, I believe that simply is referring to obedience to God's commands. God has revealed His will regarding how we should conduct ourselves in life, and we have various passages of Scripture that attest to that fact. I think of First Thessalonians uh, that says, this is the will of God, your sanctification. Very clear what God's will is for us. And there's other passages of Scripture that have similar uh, instructions for us. And so as we look at this, those who do God's will, that's what it's talking about. Those who obey the commands of Scripture, those that are doing what He says. I think this serves as a wake-up call to those who might think that they're in with Jesus. I, I go to church. I may even put something in the offering play. They might think they're, they're close to Jesus. But what does the rest of the week look like? What goes on in your heart and in your mind? No matter how close you think you are with Jesus, no matter what kind of connection you think you might have by virtue of different activities that you might be engaged in, if you're not following the commands of Jesus Christ, you're on the outside. The religious leaders thought that they were in with God, that they were on the inside, but they were not. They were on the outside. They were not obeying the will of God. They rejected the Messiah, so they were on the outside. His own family and friends, they seemed to reject his claims. They, they want to hinder him from what they're doing. They want to detain him, to restrain him. But for the time being, they seem to be on the outside as well. We do see later on that some of them do come to a place where they do embrace Jesus for who he is. But right here, it really does seem like they're on the outside. There's various passages of Scripture that come to mind as consider this concept. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. This is how we know that we know Him, if we keep His commands. The one who says, I have come to know Him, yet doesn't keep His commands, he is a liar. The truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly in him, the love of God is made complete. This is how we know we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. Obviously, that doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. We're not going to live a sinless life. But it does mean that our lives ought to reflect a life of walking with Jesus. Our lives ought to be marked by obedience to His commands as those who follow Him. It is the one who consistently walks in willful, unrepentant sin and rebellion against God. Those are the ones that are not part of God's family. They are not His brothers and sisters. But for those of us who do embrace Jesus as the Messiah, embrace Him for who He is, and the work that he did on this earth, and who do follow his commands, he calls us family. He calls us brothers and sisters. We are family. There's relationship there. There's communion there. Listen to these other passages. John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. He came to his own. His own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him. He gave them the right to be children of God to those who believe in His name. And I love Romans chapter 8. Here's verses 14 through 17. For all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit Himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, 
if indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified with him. Co-heirs with Jesus Christ, children of God, adopted into his family. It's a beautiful thing to be part of God's family. At the start of this, as we looked at these, these different passages today, we have one literary unit that seems to be broken down kind of into three parts. You got the family seeking to restrain him, the scribes attributing his power to Satan, Jesus' response to that, and then Jesus redefining what it means to be family. As I was studying this, it really became clear to me that this the structure here uh, fits into what is called a chiastic structure. I don't want to get too technical, but if you're not familiar with what a with a chiasm or a chiasm is, it's a literary device that's used to emphasize a particular point. And there's, there's a few different ways to arrange a chiasm to communicate in a certain way, but here's one such structure where there is a point and then another point and then a third point, but then it kind of walks back and the fourth point corresponds to the second, and the fifth point corresponds to the first. And I think there is, some, there is something like that going on here, and it seems to be arranged in this way. His own people seek to restrain him. We see that in those first few verses there. The scribes attribute Jesus' power to that of the devil, to Satan. Then Jesus offers his defense. But then we see Jesus giving very direct words, the consequences of attributing his work to the power of Satan. And he tells us what that is. That is the unpardonable sin, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And then in that last section, we see the consequences of hindering Jesus' ministry. When his own family seemed to think he was insane and rejecting him, but the, the purpose of these structures is to get us to see the main point. And the main point is found here in Jesus' defense. We have these different things going on, but Jesus' defense there, that bold declaration that he makes, he's not crazy, he's not a liar. But He is Lord, and He is Lord. He demonstrates that lordship by plundering the very house of the devil himself. Jesus is setting free those who are bound by the devil. Though there are those around Him who seek to restrain Him, they want to bind Jesus. Jesus will not be bound, but instead Jesus is the one doing the binding, and Jesus plunders the house of the devil this demonstrates that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is to be heeded. He is to be obeyed. He is not a liar. He is not a lunatic. He is Lord. And the Lord must be obeyed or else you are no family of His. But for those that do embrace Him as Lord, who do seek to follow the will of God, to obey the clear commands of Scripture... We are His family, and that is a beautiful thing. And if that describes you, I hope you're encouraged by that. But if it doesn't, I encourage you to think on these things, to repent and trust in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we are so very thankful for Your Word. Thank You for this clear demonstration that Jesus gives showing that He is Lord. He has power and authority over the demonic realm, over Satan himself. He has come to set the captives free. Lord, in our natural state, we are all captive to sin, slaves to unrighteousness, enemies with You. But because of the work of Jesus Christ, because of His death, burial, and resurrection, all those who place their faith and the trust, repent, turning from their sin, can find 
new life and freedom in Christ Jesus. Thank you that we can be confident that Jesus was not a madman. Jesus was not a deceiver, a liar. But rather, He is exactly who He claimed to be, the Messiah, God in human flesh. Pray that we can constantly, Lord, be, be studying Your Word and, and seeing the, the clear commands of Scripture that You have given us. Thank You for for saving us, for those that that do place their trust in you, that you save us and you adopt us into your family and and we can be called brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, co-heirs of the kingdom of God with Jesus Christ. What blessed truth. Thank you so much. As we go our separate ways today, I do pray that you would guide us, direct us, Help us to be good witnesses for you as we seek to bring the gospel and make disciples. Pray that we can help lead people into the truth. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.